I, I enjoyed uh, Owen's and John's overview both of the essence of the Abbey Larry decision, which is after all the, the ultimate cause of the amendments, and also Owen's assessment of the practical uh, implications of the um, uh, the practical implications of Iraqis inquiries. Uh, I've been asked to talk about what I think the, um, the proposed 30th Amendment would actually mean. Um, I, uh, first, I think uh, it's worth adding to what Owen and John said about the Abbey Lara decision. Uh, something that's been overlooked, I think, is, is its ideological aspects. Uh, ultimately, uh, I think that the constitutional adjudication always blurs the lines between, between the judicial and the political because of the very open textures. Uh, nature of constitutional language, which essentially invite, invites inevitable appraisals uh, of an ideological nature, and whatever whatever fictions we lawyers might uh, construct for ourselves to, to, to try to, to try to deny that. And ultimately, the, as John pointed out, uh, the the reason, the, the most basic reason, the both the most basic necessity for the amendment lies in the fact uh, that ultimately the Supreme Court decided that uh, inquiry was not one of the inherent powers of the National Parliament. The Iraqis, uh, the, I believe, along with uh, Owen and John, I think, that the, uh, the, the, uh, the powers of the organs of the state in the Constitution aren't exhaustively enumerated, and that the question of what inherent powers the Iraqis enjoys is essentially interpretive, and that it rests inevit inevitably then on an idea of what the National Parliament is for, which is essentially an ideological question. You can try to resolve it partly with reference to history, partly with reference to practice, partly with reference to legal materials, but you exhaust and go beyond legal materials in deciding what the jurisdiction and the power of the Iraqis uh, ultimately is. So that's what I mean by the ideological, assess the ideological aspects of the Abi Lara decision. Uh, and this is fascinating, I think, because it ties into the cultural attitudes of lawyers towards politics and the political, and that's something which it, it arises again and again in the, <coughs> the discourse surrounding both of them. There, there are good and bad reasons uh, for, for supporting or opposing either of the amendments, but what constantly arises in public commentary is a sort of a sniffy, loyally disdain towards the political. Uh, judges and lawyers are always concerned about constraining the political uh, and never concerned with empowering it towards what it's properly supposed to do. And there was an interesting distinction in the Aguilar uh, judgment, which both Owen and John touched upon, between uh, the, uh, between inquiring either into members of houses of the, uh, the houses of the office themselves, or inquiring into the executive and the performance of the executive, which both are um, uh, which both are uh, explicit constitutional powers, and even a member of the Gorlishia Corner being an extension of the executive in a broad sense. Uh, there is also a, a question about what uh, the purpose of representative politics is when it comes to inquiring into private matters into juridically, technically private matters, matters such as the conduct of bankers, and which might go towards holding powerful uh, private as well as public interests to account. And ultimately, at, at the heart of the Abbey Lara decision, I think, was a conservative assessment of what representative politics is for, uh, which decided ultimately that it didn't entail holding private, powerful private interests uh, to account. Uh, and again, that goes towards the cultural uh, attitude of lawyers towards the political. It, it wasn't these sorts of constitutional decisions are never completely made with reference to legal materials, and there was an ideological appraisal uh, at the heart uh, of the at the heart of the Abi Lara uh, decision. Uh, I appreciate that Owen has pointed out the practical difficulties in that um, power to inquire into or the, the power to hold powerful private interests to account being effectively or pragmatically exercised. I appreciate that as well. Uh, but that wasn't the uh, the ultimate reason for the Abi Lara decision, as, as John pointed out, it was um, it was uh, ultimately a values oriented. It was an ideological decision as to what the purpose of a national parliament is. Um, the I mean, it, one thing that I found hard to fathom in the Abi Lara judgment was that the the powers of the government, the powers of the executive, have always been determined as being indeterminate. Uh, the, the constitution does say what some powers of the government are, but it simply defines as the executive power of the state. And the assessment of what that, what that entails is not a legal question purely, it's a very ideologically laden question as well. They but there are, yes. The executive itself have been here in power. Yes, there, had, there's been, there, there's, there has been far more, uh, there's been far more reluctance to read in uh, inherence or implicit powers into political representatives than there has been into, into, the, uh, into, the, uh, into the executive power, which I think, again, uh, is partly not only ideological but almost 
cultural, but you can't dissociate it from the general habitus of lawyers, the general prevailing attitudes towards the political, what the political is for, and what the political can achieve. But now I was going on a tangent and not talking about what I was asked to talk about, which is what uh, the, uh, the 13th Amendment will actually uh, entail. And you'd swear from what I'd said that I was uh, enthusiastic about uh, 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 expanding the, uh, about overturning the Abilar decision and about expanding uh, the powers of uh, the, the bureaucracy in an inquiry oriented direction, but no, that's actually, uh, that's not the case. Now, uh, on a practical matter, matter I feel um, unprepared to my, to my colleagues because I didn't even bring a slide uh, with the wording of the amendment itself, which was, which was a, a big oversight, so apologies for that, I'll have to read out parts of it. Uh, but, Oh, yeah, okay, John has one, brilliant. Okay, oh, nice. okay. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can do this. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, the, um, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the first and the most obvious consequence of the amendment, if passed, will be to correct uh, the jurisdictional deficit, de deficit the jurisdictional um, uh, flaw, which the Abilara Court identifies. And whatever, the, whatever the, the political and legal debates about what the inherent powers of a national parliament and the constitution entail, uh, the amendment will resolve that by making explicit uh, the power of the Iraqis to conduct inquiries, not only uh, into matters of public interest, but also those matters which may uh, entail um, in, uh, inquiry into the conduct of uh, individuals, whether uh, individuals acting in public uh, or private uh, contexts. So that's one um, absolutely uh, unambiguous uh, aspect of that. Um, of that uh, amendment. I don't think that that's inherently problematic. Uh, as John pointed out, the Supreme Court itself uh, didn't identify anything problematic as such in, um, uh, in politicians conducting I I inquiries uh, of this sort. Uh, what is problematic it, is that, it, in fact, contrary to the, uh, to the literature and to the statements of members of the government, that the wording of the amendment goes beyond merely correcting a jurisdictional deficit. Uh, if it merely corrected the jurisdictional deficits, what would occur would, that the would be that the houses of the Iraqis uh, would have the same power to inquire into individual conduct and matters of general public importance that has always been enjoyed uh, by the tribunals of inquiry, but within the same limits of constitutional rights and natural justice within which the tribunals of inquiry have operated. Uh, the, uh, if uh, the Iraqis had merely been given uh, if the office had been merely given the power to inquire, the explicit power to inquire, which overturned the Abbey Lara decision, that would then still have been subject to the existing jurisprudence or case law of natural justice. Uh, natural justice simply meaning that uh, whenever, the, uh, whenever any organs of state are empowered to do things which might adversely affect uh, individuals, uh, that they must uh, exercise those powers in a manner compliant with the right to a fair hearing and the right and the rule against bias and that one is entitled, in particular, to have an inquiry conducted in a manner which respects the right to a fair hearing, in particular the right to respond to one's accusers and to defend one's good name, and also uh, the right uh, to be free from any bias, bias in the conduct uh, of uh, that... Um, oh, sorry. Uh, isn't what I wanted to get. I wanted to, I wanted to shrink it, but um, anyway, brightness isn't not. Sorry. Okay. And, um, Right, so uh, both, if you, so the first section, uh, which, uh, subsection 2 of the proposed uh, new uh, Article 15, Section 10, uh, will clearly say that each house should have the power to conduct an inquiry uh, in the manner prescribed by law, in any matter stated by the house or houses concerned to be of general public importance. Uh, that's not inherently problematic, nor is subsection 3, uh, which goes on to say that in the course of any such inquiry, well, that you can't, uh, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, and that in some cases uh, those inquiries may include inquiries which may have, have an impact uh, uh, on the, um, which may have a finding uh, relevance to the conduct of individuals, and it, well, which makes sense because it's difficult to see how any substantive inquiry into matter of public importance uh, could be effective if it uh, could make at least some conclusions as to individual uh, conduct. Uh, neither of those two, neither, not, not, neither of those elements I think would be inherently problematic uh, if it had stopped there. Uh, because I think uh, that the, if the jurisdictional deficit had merely been corrected by the 13th Amendment, uh, that uh, the, this would have meant that the conduct of those inquiries provided for in the amendment would be subject to the same restraints of natural justice within which uh, the tribunals and other forms of inquiry have always had to operate. But to my mind, and there is some, there is some legitimate disagreement on this point, but to my mind, uh, the, the proposed... Uh, article, uh, the proposed uh, subsection 4 uh, of the amendment uh, changes this. 
It, does, it means that the amendment goes beyond the mere correction of a jurisdictional deficit and actually changes the substantive requirements of procedural fairness or natural justice that will apply to the Iraqis inquiry specifically. Why? Because uh, at worst it excludes judicial review in a, in a, in, of Iraqis inquiries in a wide range of cases and at best I think it alters the test. Uh, it alters the test for when judicial review will uh, apply uh, by suggesting at least a deference towards uh, the balance between the common good and uh, individual rights uh, that the, the Iraqis itself will decide in legislating for uh, inquiries. And uh, I think that that is, a, an, is an inevitable conclusion, and I think that it's, uh, it's actually, in fact, an inclusion to which uh, the, uh, the Minister uh, for Public Expenditure Reform has admitted. Uh, he stated in an Irish Times article that the amendment will alter the balance of the tests that the courts apply. So the official line has been for a while that judicial review will be unaffected, that judicial review will remain available in the same range and type of cases in, uh, in respect of which it's available for the, uh, for the tribunals. Uh, but, uh, so there has been a sort of a contradictory discourse in the sense that the official line has been that judicial review and the right of judicial review uh, will remain unaffected. But at the same time, there has been an expressed wish uh, to have inquir these inquiries conducted in a more expedient, uh, quicker and cheaper manner uh, than, in, than in which the tribunals of inquiry have been conducted. And so there has been an explicit ambition of uh, reconfiguring or rebalancing uh, the, uh, the balance uh, between uh, the right of individuals to fairness in the conduct of inquiries and the public interest in not having those inquiries excessively delayed uh, and, um, and encumbered uh, by, the chat, by, by judicial review, by people who feel that the uh, inquiries are conducted uh, in a manner contrary to constitutional or natural justice. Uh, so, for example, the, uh, the, <coughs> uh, the, the explanatory memorandum which accompanies the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the amendments uh, is replete with these contradictions in that it says that, um, uh, that, if I could just find the exact quote, that the, um, uh, pardon me, is that a key requirement for the new system of Iraqis inquiry established will be adherence to the rules of natural justice consistent with constitutional principles. And that appeared to suggest that the intention of the amendment, and of course the intention of the amendment isn't determinative of how it would ultimately be interpreted by the courts, but nonetheless, that would have suggested that the intention of the amendment uh, was to empower, jurisdictionally empower the Iraqis to inquire, but without altering the rights to natural justice uh, that the person subject to those inquiries would enjoy. But then within the same document, it also went on to state the requirement in a new inquiry system to balance the exercise of these rights against the public interest in the facilitation of effective parliamentary investigations. Well, both can't be true at the same time. It can't both be true that the right of judicial review remains completely unaltered, completely unaffected, but also that there's a rebalancing which will empower and facilitate the public interest in precluding excessive encumbrance or excessive delays of the new Iraqis inquiries through uh, judicial review. So what I think that uh, a subsection 4 probably means, or what's, what it's intended to mean, is that the Iraqis itself will legislate, as it proposes to do, to regulate the manner, the specific manner in which the new inquiries uh, will be conducted, and that, uh, yes, of course, uh, as with all public bodies, the, those committees uh, will be limited to the virres or the powers contained in the legislation itself, so that judicial review, I think, would at least con continue to apply in that minimal matter. However, I think that subsection 4 also uh, suggests or invites at least deference towards the balance expressed in that legislation itself as between the public interest and uh, individual rights, and I think it clearly means uh, that uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, that the, the courts are to defer to the vision of balance which that will contain. In other, in other words, I think that it doesn't exclude judicial review wholesale, but it does exclude review, or it does, it does at least suggest deference in re any review of the constitutionality of the legislation for Iraqis inquiries itself, any review uh, of the uh, constitutionality of the balance between uh, the public interest and individual rights which, uh, those, uh, which that legislation will embody and express. So I think that it's almost beyond doubt uh, that what we see here is a reconfiguration of uh, expediency and rights. It's it beyond doubt that we see a reconfiguration as to the, the, the balance of authority between uh, the, houses, the legislature 
and uh, the courts in this matter, in that I think the courts are directed to defer, to, at least to some degree, towards the question, the very politically loaded question, of how public interest and individual rights are to, be, are to be reconciled in this particular case. The wording of the amendment has changed since it was initially published, and the, uh, the, in, in, in response to the public concerns that were initially raised um, about the wording of the 13th Amendment and its capacity to curtail judicial review, uh, well, uh, the, the, the phrase, with due regard to the principles of fair procedures, was inserted. So it initially said it shall be for the, house, the houses to balance uh, the public interest against individual rights in regulating the way in which the inquiries would be conducted. And then uh, the, um, the, the, the this inserted the clause, with due regard to principles of fair procedures. Some seem to suggest that that will at least, um, that will at least uh, maintain an outer limit of judicial review, uh, a residual level of judicial review, uh, in which any, any, all, any outright discarding of procedural fairness or natural justice would be subject uh, to review in the constitutionality of the legislation. Um, I, I still think that the, the, the terms, the language of the, the amendment is very directive. It, it says that it shall be for the House or Houses concerned uh, to, to determine the balance. And that it, it doesn't completely exclude judicial review, I think, but it does reconfigure uh, the degree of deference uh, that, the, uh, that the courts are to exercise with respect uh, to assessing uh, the constitutionality uh, of the legislation. Now, it's, it, it's not an absolutely clear point, and ultimately it does depend, I mean, it's not, uh, it, it does depend on the attitude, I think, that the Supreme Court or High Court will adopt uh, towards uh, the desirability or the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the fairness of public inquiries. I think that's also uh, an, an, an inevitable aspect of the assessment. I think that it, it, it's not quite reducible to the, to, the te to the text of the amendment alone, uh, but uh, in any case, I mean, judicial review applies as a rule in the Constitution. In other words, uh, constitutional rules uh, are, unless otherwise stated, subject to enforcement by the courts. Uh, so the, the real question in this um, clause of the amendment is whether that is explicitly, whether it explicitly ousts the jurisdiction of the courts with regard to a particular matter. And I don't think it's a black and white issue necessarily of, of determining whether this is an ouster clause, whether it ousts the jurisdiction of the courts in respect of this particular matter. I think it also comes in shades of deference. Uh, sh shades of deference and, and anxiety towards uh, the, 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 uh, the values and the balance uh, embodied in the legislation, and it is a, a counter-argument to what I'm saying is possibly the fact that where uh, judicial review is to be excluded, that the Constitution explicitly states this, that, for example, in respect to Article 45, the Directive of Principles of Social Policy, which says things about very uh, aspirational, uh, nice things about social justice, it explicitly said that that's for the attention of the Iraqis alone, that it's not uh, directed uh, at the courts as such to enforce, and there is also an, a, 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 an exclusion or an ouster clause with respect to reviewing uh, the exercise of the powers of the presidency. Uh, so uh, it, it might be objective that if uh, judicial review were to be excluded, that it would actually say that more explicitly. Uh, but I mean, the, the language it shall be for the houses, house or ho house or houses concerned to determine the balance, so on. I think uh, that uh, the, the very directive and nature of the language suggests at least a degree of exclusivity or at least a degree of deference for the houses in the balance they decide to execute between uh, individual rights and the common good, as, as you might call it. Uh, and, I mean, it's not, it, it's not unusual uh, to say that the, um, uh, to say that the Oireachtas, as well as the courts, has a role in constitutional interpretation, in interpreting constitutional terms. And when it, that's why when it inserts the phrase with due regard to the principles of fair procedures, that doesn't necessarily restore the full jurisdiction of the courts, I think. Uh, it might be interpreted that it is, up, it is in fact up to the houses themselves to determine and to interpret what fair procedures means uh, in this context. Of course, constitutions are laden with very, uh, with very ideological and political terms, uh, to which, uh, and it falls to the parliament, as well as the courts sometimes, to interpret those. And so I think it might take that much of a push uh, in the awarding of the amendments uh, to have a far-reaching exclusion of judicial review, which I think is quite a worrying thing. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, because that this idea of the Iraqis already having a jurisdiction of some sorts over constitutional interpretation is clear from the fact that, say, for example, in the Roach and Roach case, which concerns the constitutional status of frozen embryos, Justice Hardiman said that the primary, the initial responsibility for interpreting the constitution, always falls with the Iraqis itself 
uh, in any case. And what, what's worrying about, about this, I think, is that it might diminish uh, the, uh, I suppose, the check, uh, the, the system checks and balances, to free love that often cliche, uh, the, check, the system checks and balances as between uh, the Iraqis and the, and the courts, in the sense that I think that one of the best parts of our, of our constitutional tradition is that uh, the, uh, the, the, the safeguarding of constitutional rights, such as natural justice, is pushed beyond, for the most part, the vagaries of parliamentary politics. And I think that the, uh, the, 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 the passing of uh, this particular part of the 13th Amendment will have the capacity to diminish that system of checks and balances. It will have the capacity to diminish uh, the, uh, that tradition according to which the safeguarding of constitutional rights is not a matter for the houses or houses themselves to determine, but is ultimately uh, subject to judicial uh, enforcement. So I, I, I'm happy to take any questions along with the questions for uh, John and Owen, and thanks for your attention.